Good morning and welcome as we gather to, to worship today. Um, just last weekend, Cindy and I were talking about how we couldn't remember the last time uh, we had rain on a Sunday. Maybe we shouldn't have had that conversation. Uh, but we are in the midst of, of a, a rainy time for the first time in quite a while. Uh, but my hope is that our time together in worship will be a, a source of light and hope and inspiration for you all. <clears throat> there are some uh, announcements I would share with you. And, and the first is uh, a reminder that in a couple of weeks, we will be celebrating on the first Sunday of October, World Communion Sunday. That is one of my favorite communion services of, of the year uh, because we join with people all over the world in celebrating communion. And we will be doing it again this year, however, it will be virtual, uh, but we will still celebrate communion that day and our bond to others around not only the, the city of Palmetto and the state of Florida and the United States, but indeed all around the world will be uh, a very important part of that day. And so I invite you to make sure you have some bread and, and something you will use as grape juice. Uh, if it's grape juice, fine. If it's wine, that's, that's fine. Uh, if it's something else, that's fine too. Uh, the important part is that we are, will be sharing together and we will be reminded of our unity with literally uh, millions upon millions, if not billions of people around our world. And so, I invite you to, to be ready for that first Sunday of October. I'd also like to, to say that uh, come the end of the month, we will be sending a, a check to Cedar Kirk in memory of Jerry Boy. And if you would like to make a donation in Jerry's memory, uh, we invite you to do so. Just indicate that on, on a memo line of a check or uh, let us know in some way that this donation is is in Jerry's memory. He was one of the the people that helped found that camp that has been enjoyed by uh, not only youth but adults across the years. And what better way to to remember our friend and, and colleague Jerry Boy than than through a memorial gift to Cedar Kirk. Those are the announcements that I would share with you this morning. I would invite you as our service continues to, to listen to 
that wonderful old hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. And if you'd like to sing along at home, feel free to do so. It appears we're having some technical difficulties, so I, I invite you to take just a, a few seconds and read through those words. Um, they are very current. And in the meantime, uh, we'll get ready for the, for the scripture lesson. And if you'll excuse me for one half a second, uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> service this morning, I invite you to join with me and both read the scripture lesson and, and listen to it. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful story that, that comes to us from Mark's gospel in the 10th, 10th chapter. They came to Jericho. And then he is, and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And as they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, 
what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. <clears throat> Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. I have been sharing over these past several weeks uh, some one-liners from, from Yogi Berra. I am nearing the end of that list, uh, but I continue to say every week that uh, not only do some of the things that Yogi says cause us to laugh, but even the ones that cause us to laugh often have some wisdom hidden inside them. Uh, whether they came from Yogi or his good friend Joe Garagiola is uh, up to some debate, but there is tremendous wisdom in them, and, and I share these with you. First, take it with a grin of salt. Can you imagine how much better our life would be if we would take a lot of the things that drive us crazy with a grin of salt? What, what a great play on words. And then speaking about the 1973 Mets, we were overwhelming underdogs. Uh, what a great saying that is. And, and I think my, my favorite might be having been a Little League parent. Uh, little League baseball is a very good thing because it keeps the parents off the streets. Uh, if you've been to Little League baseball games, sometimes you might wish the parents were on the streets instead of in the stands. But uh, Yogi had a way with words. And there is, there is wisdom within them, and they cause us to chuckle as well. Mark had a way with words, too, a powerful way. And if we read through the Gospel of Mark, there's story after story after story after story of the disciples especially being blind, blind to who Jesus was and, and what Jesus called them to do, even though they heard it, even though Peter uh, said the right words, he had no clue about what he was really saying. And we come to, to this story, and it, it takes place on, on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. Back in 1994, Cinda and I had the opportunity to go to the Holy Land. And it just so happened that, that the schedule of our tour took us to Jericho three of the five days that we were on the tour. And uh, we had lunch uh, for three days at the last Temptation restaurant in Jericho. Uh, of course, nobody was taking advantage of, of the biblical story at that point when they named that restaurant. But we got to travel the road from Jericho back to Jerusalem on, on three different occasions. And uh, that's about a 15-mile or so jaunt. And there was a law back in the day of, of Jesus that uh, every able-bodied male uh, was required to come to Jerusalem to worship in the temple at the time of Passover. And so literally thousands of people who lived within that 15-mile radius would be coming to Jerusalem, and Jericho is right on the edge of that 15-mile radius. And it is a, an uphill climb from Jericho, which is uh, down... Uh, relatively close to the Dead Sea, up to Jerusalem, where the temple was on the Temple Mount. And as Jesus and the disciples are making that journey, you can imagine that, that there is a crowd of people pushing upon one another, crowded together, 
uh, making that long uphill journey and, and sitting by the roadside is a blind beggar. Bartimaeus. And he hears who is coming because that's the way things would have happened in that day. And, and so he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And as soon as he calls out, the people start to tell him to be quiet. And the first thing we can learn in this passage is the example of Bartimaeus. He speaks out over and against all the negativity. I've seen this story played out over and over and over again, where people have been listening to the negativity for years and even decades. Sometimes it has come from a chorus of people, but many times it has come from one or two people with especially profound influence over a person. And the negativity comes in things like, you're not good enough, you'll never amount to anything. Oh, you're such a troublemaker. And the list goes on and on and on. The number of people whose lives are transformed by those negative messages is incredible. You, you've, you've heard it said, or perhaps you, you've read it, that, that no child ever comes into this world hating other people. That is a learned behavior. No child ever comes into this world with, with prejudice or hate that is learned. And no child ever comes into this world with a sense of what they cannot do. That has been learned. It is said that we hear some 18,000 negative comments about who we are before we're 18 years old and the number of positive comments is far less than a thousand. The voices of negativity are incredibly powerful. They stick with us. Sometimes we, we try to put on a good front. front. There are, are many who have been workaholics in life, who have lost families and gained prestige in jobs, because they're driven by the voice of a father or mother or other influential person who told them at an early age, you're never going to amount to much. I had a friend in, in another church who was incredibly successful. He had written as an insurance agent at, at the time, one of the largest policies that was ever written for the Hartford. And his commission check was incredible. And yet all he could think of was his father's constant criticism of him how his father said over and over again, he didn't have what it took. You see, my friend also was an excellent musician. And that just didn't fit into his father's world or worldview of what a son should be like. And so it didn't matter how successful that son was, he, he struggled with the anxiety, the constant anxiety of hearing his father's negative words to him, you, you don't measure up. And how many times people are guided by the negative 
words that have been spoken to them. You're too fat. You're too short. You're too ugly. One of Yogi Berra's comments that, that I, I wanted to save until this point was, so what if I'm ugly? Nobody ever hit a baseball with their face. What a wonderful and powerful statement that is, but how many people live instead in a, in a sense of shame, in a sense of, of not being good enough because they listen to the negative comments. Bartimaeus is a reminder to us that we don't need to do that. And the more they rebuked him and told him to be quiet, the louder he cried out, the louder he spoke up. How important that is for us to speak up. There are folks who have carried burdens for years upon years who simply need to speak up to give voice to their own goodness, to accept that, to believe that, to at the very least speak up to themselves. and say to themselves, I am not who you think I am. I am a precious child of God. I am a person of infinite worth and value. <clears throat> who I am is not measured by the job I have or the money I make. It is measured by God's claim upon my life. I will never forget this moment. We had been gathered as a group. I, I was asked to chair a, a committee that was looking at starting a new church in, in the uh, greater Painesville, Ohio area. And we had gathered leaders from um, several churches to to begin to put together a plan. And as it was our custom, we, we would have a time at the beginning of each, each meeting with, with prayer concerns and start with a moment of prayer. And one in the group said that his prayer concern was for a family in the church that was going through a difficult and painful divorce and how that was reverberating throughout the church and <clears throat> creating a great deal of, of pain and heartache and how it had the potential to perhaps divide the church. And as he was sharing, our attention began to shift from his sharing to one of the the fine, staunch lay people of, of the committee who was sitting at, at the other end of the table, and he began to sob. And the sobs became louder and, and even more uncontrollable. And so we just sat there, and what I would like to say is holy silence. And finally, he was able to stop sobbing. <clears throat> and he said, for the last 60 years, I have carried around the guilt and shame that somehow, as a six-year-old boy, I caused my parents to get divorced. And when I heard you share that, <clears throat> all the pain and the shame just came bubbling up. 
And for the first time, for the first time, I decided instead of listening to the pain and shame, he said, I decided to pray the words that we've said so often, Lord, have mercy on me. The same words that, that Bartimaeus says in our story, Lord, have mercy on me. And as all that, that pain and hurt of 60 years came bubbling up and overflowing, he said, for the first time, I feel refreshed and renewed. And the person inside of me is congruent with the person who's been a part of the church for all these years and behaved in, in the best ways I knew how as a faithful follower of Christ. For the first time in my adult life, I feel like I'm legitimately following Christ and have been purified by him. He spoke out first to himself. And isn't it interesting that he used those words that Bartimaeus used? And I wonder, as I shared with our Bible study, what would happen in our lives if the first words of every prayer we utter were, Lord, have mercy on me. But how often do we begin our prayers uttering our, our desires to God rather than setting the stage for the way we can legitimately approach God. Lord, have mercy on me. There is so much healing in those words. There is so much strength in those words. There is so much new life in those words. He didn't listen to the negativity, Bartimaeus didn't. He didn't be quiet. He spoke out. And the third thing he did that is so important for us today is he didn't wait. As soon as, as the disciples said, come, he sprang up. He sprang up and came to Jesus. Now, it would be one thing if he was doing that with his sight. It's another thing as a blind man. What incredible trust and faith to even take the first step. How often do we miss out on the very blessings that God wants to give us and shower upon us? the new life that God is just waiting to give us because we choose instead to wait. We've got something else we'd like to take care of. We've got some uh, fault we'd like to get rid of. Waiting is a dangerous and deadly game. I had the good fortune as, as a young teenage boy to, to go to a summer camp in New Hampshire. And at the time, I didn't realize just how fortunate and privileged I was to spend eight weeks every summer in New Hampshire. I also didn't realize how excited and glad my parents must have been to have me spend eight weeks each summer in New Hampshire. But be that as it may, I, I enjoyed those four summers up there immensely. And every night we had a, a Vesper service, and every Sunday we had a, a church service, and every camper was expected to be there. There were no excused absences. Now, this was an athletic camp, a sports camp, uh, an outdoor camp, but every 
evening and every Sunday, we had a service and, and counselors and camp staff would take turns leading it. And I'll always remember one of those, especially, because Pinky Stover, who, who was a, a fixture in the camp, he, he had been a camper when the camp first opened, and he had stayed on over 60 years to be a part of, of camp life. And uh, he was the camp banker. And so whenever we would draw, withdraw money from our account to make uh, the trip across the, the street to the local uh, dime store for our Sunday afternoon run, uh, he was the one we would get our dollar from or our two dollars from if we were going to be really extravagant. And he was always around and he was much beloved. And this one Sunday, he shared this story about a, a camper who had gotten a new track suit. And that track suit included a, a pair of spikes track spikes and he wore them everywhere to break them in but also to kind of show off that that he was a track star and one day he had worn them down around the beach area and and there was a a wife of of somebody associated with the camp who was walking her dog and somehow the little dog had gotten loose and ran off the end of the dock and went down in the lake and sunk to the bottom and she was screaming for help and he was the person closest by and so he ran to help but when he got to the end of the dock he didn't just jump in he took time to take off his track suit and to neatly fold it. And he took time to undo his track spikes and to lay them neatly by his track uniform. And he took time to, to take off the socks that he was wearing and, and put them neatly with the rest of his equipment. And then he jumped in the water. But by the time he had done all those things, by the time he had waited to make sure his, his prized track suit was taken care of and his prized track spikes were, were taken care of, by the time he jumped into the water and, and got the dog, the little dog had drowned. And Pinky said these words, that I will always remember. There will come a time in your life when it is critical that you not wait, but that you act. It may be to save someone else's life. It may be to save your own. It may be to do something important that will impact the lives of many. It may be to do something important that will impact yours. And it may not just be a single time, it may be several times, but when those times come, never wait. And he said this, and I believe whenever those times come, they will always be accompanied by a fear, a fear that you might lose something precious, a fear that somebody might speak up and out against you, a, a fear that you might make a mistake. But he said, I urge you never to listen to those fears. Go ahead and act. And isn't that exactly what we see in this story? Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, springing up and going to 
to Jesus the Christ and I'm not sure whether it was his actual going to meet Christ or the fact that he sprang up to go to meet him but either way it doesn't matter his faith brought back his sight You and I are called to be like Bartimaeus. To say no to the voices of negativity that, that come our way. To speak out and to speak up, even if it is just to ourselves. And to act, and especially to act when the voices of fear are telling us to wait. And just like Bartimaeus, when we do that, we will see again. We will see life in a whole new way, the way God intends us to see it. Amen. We are so blessed and fortunate to, to have the opportunities to connect with our good friend, Tony Last, who is in England, and they have their lockdown situations with the coronavirus, just like we do. Uh, but he has transformed a garage into a recording studio, and it is to our benefit. And and I look forward to the special music Tony will share with us. Some of us are in the midst of, of rain. Some of us are in, in the midst of beautiful weather. And some of us are somewhere in between. But we know from <clears throat> the newscast that there are many many people in the western part of our country 
who are victims <clears throat> of unrestrained forest fires, communities that have been wiped out, lives that have been lost. Lord, as we face devastation like this, grief like this, we can only cry out, Lord, help us, have mercy upon us. Be with all those victims Bring healing to them, bring courage to them, bring hope to them. Help them to grieve, but also to move on when the time comes. We thank you for every single courageous firefighter who is putting his or her life on the line to fight fires in, in that area, who are facing immense odds and brutal challenges to, to strength and stamina. whose courage is a model for us all. Be with each and every one of them and their families who live with the constant pressure of knowing whether or not their loved one is safe. They are the firefighters in the news, but we know there are firefighters and first responders all around our country who are equally brave and, and doing courageous things, and we give you thanks for them all. And for the medical people who are there, and for the social workers and and the clergy and, and everybody who is there seeking to be a source of strength in a time of utter devastation. We ask you as, as well to be with everyone who is fighting cancer especially those for whom the cancer has recurred, be a source of strength to them. Be their source of healing. Give the doctors and, and nurses and all who are part of their treatment, give them wisdom and insight and the healing touch of your presence. Work through them. Make them extensions of your healing. And of course, all those who are fighting COVID-19, all of the brave first responders and, and doctors and nurses and hospital staffs that are pushed to the brink and awaiting the possibility of, of another wave coming soon. And the families, especially those families that, that are isolated from loved ones and those whose hearts have been broken by the sadness and heartache of death. Touch each and every one with, with your gentle healing touch. And when the time is right, as you know it to be right, 
help the reality and the truth of Easter burst into their hearts. And we continue to pray that you will be with our leaders at every stage and place in this country. Do the things that only you can do, but give us voice as we need to have voice. Help us rise above the very things that divide us and begin to look at that which unites us. Free us from the traps of empty criticism and help all of us and all of our leaders put aside the nonsense and seek to work together in cooperation to discover solutions. We lift up these and all our prayers in the name and spirit of Jesus the Christ and as his disciples we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. So be it and amen. Our closing hymn is, is again, a, a wonderful hymn, Revive Us Again. ensemble to, to share in our music each week and uh, that really makes a difference I know to me and I trust it does to you. 
would you join me in our closing benediction? You know it well. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. God has a purpose in our being there. Christ, who dwells within us, has something he wants to do through us where we are. And now as we go forth, I invite you to believe this and to go in the joy of God's power, the joy of God's love, and the joy of God's grace. So be it. The Savior has come in his mighty power and spoken peace to my soul. And all of my life from that very hour, I yielded to his control. I yielded to his control. Oh, oh, oh it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful. What Jesus has done for the soul of Florida has never been told. Never been told. It is wonderful. It is wonderful. It is marvelous and wonderful. Wonderful. What Jesus has done for this soul of great week. And those who are ready to stay for a fellowship time, please do.